Today I would like to ask both of you a little bit more about the activities that you do because you are both, or I think I can say that you are both activists or you are part of the struggle against the occupation of Palestine. Um, maybe if you can talk a little bit about how you started to get involved, uh, how were you thinking whether to choose I don't know, being an activist or getting involved with an NGO, the difference between like a charity, solidarity and activism. And <laughs> I know it's a broad question, but you can make it short. <laughs> start. If you want. Uh, I started as an activist when I was born. I was born in 1988. <laughs> yeah, that was even before I was born, by the way, because uh, my name was... Um, I started as an activist, to tell you the truth, it's in 1967 when my father had a, a tattoo in my name in his hand, you know, and I was born, not born in 1967. So his first tattoo in his life was the father of magic, we call ourselves like Abu something, the father of something. So that my father nickname as a freedom fighter was Abu Majid, so my, my political activism was in 1967 when my father had my name in his hand. Second, um, when I was born in 1988, yeah, I have a long story, like when it come to, um, to have a father who was in jail when you are, when you are the oldest of your family, it's a, it's a long story because in the end I did not see my father for five years and I, my, mother had to, my mother had to take care of us, me and my sister and my other sister when we are, when we are close because, and even I, I, why I was active at the time because in the end, our, as I said to you, our most important fun was when the Israeli soldiers would come to, uh, to take or jail one of my uncles, you know, who were part of some movements, you know, some, party, some political parties. So every time, I, I remember twice, twice what would happen to us, we were, as kids, look at how as kids, we were just four years old. We would go above our refugee camp home, the soldiers would come down to just knock the door, we would know that they would not knock the door yet and they would destroy it. They would come slowly, we would be above them with a stone, you know? So we'll just go, them, we'll just smuggle ourselves. So we were four years old, you know? Take the stone and just throw it on their heads, you know? And we were just four years old. That was like the biggest thing that someone four years old can do. So we would just at least injure him. He would start shooting in the sky, we'll start running from a refugee camp home to a refugee camp home to a refugee camp home. Growing up in this aspect, you know, having no father for five years, having a a father who was a freedom fighter, is having a mother who was really very active and having lived in a refugee camp in the family, all of them was in jail. My seven cousins, my seven uncles was all of them in jail. You don't have to be surprised by the way, between 1967 and 2012 there was more than a million Palestinians inside Israel. Asia. Now we are sitting here and there is 209 children inside Israel. Asia. There are between they are between, two, uh, between 12 to 17 years old. We are sitting here and there is more than seven, more than 5,000 Palestinians inside this area. But anyway, we're not to talk about that. Then um, we had lots of movements, like lots of campaigns. You get the responsibility since you are young because you had a struggle for freedom against injustice and during the occupations in Palestine. So recently, I'll just talk about my group. It's called Intifada Youth Coalition in Palestine. We do the same work that the sky is doing, and lots of movements are doing. We're very gross grassroots activists. We do popular resistance against the occupation of what is in you in our coalition. And I was telling people that we do also anonymous attack. So we have Antifada anonymous uh, attacks that we are we trying to we we did. So in seventh of May we already attacked with a lot of anonymous hackers, more than fifteen thousand Israeli Israeli websites, you know, to and to write on them that to Israel to end the occupations in the Palestinian territory. We do a lot of activities, like when I was shot 17th of January this year, we were planting 150 olive trees. After we did, we did not want to use some of the, we did not want to use the stones, like people use stone, stones even though they're far away, but we started to use the mirror because we wanted to tell the Israeli soldiers who was young that you know you have to look at the mirror. It's very important. So we carried a lot of mirrors, you know, and we cut the mirrors and we stand in front of the buffer zone, in front of the Israeli soldiers, and we said to them, look at the mirror, you know, you have to see yourself, you know, because he might not see himself. This is part of, we just, we started to fly some kites, because if you cannot go 
inside inside the, inside our Occupy territories. At least we fly the kites. They start to shoot at the kites, our kites, and then we let the kites to fly inside our Occupy territories. If we we cannot go inside our Palestine to come back as a refugee, our our kites will come back to Palestine. This is part of part of the struggle that we're doing. It might be for us. It's really a lot of fun. And in the mean, in the meantime, that is a struggling for <laughs> for justice and again, like for freedom, for okay. So I think that the main thing that um, I had to overcome, or the main act that I took, was uh, to become a conscientious objector to military service. So military service is mandatory in Israel: three years for men, two years for women. <clears throat> And I thought about it for a long time, for maybe six years, if I'm willing to be a soldier or not. But we are being raised to be soldiers from kindergarten, literally from kindergarten. Um, and I see what is happening to my nephew and nieces at the moment, who are growing up and they are being groomed to be like very strong uh, nationalistic Zionist, you know. Uh, Part of the, the elements of society. So this is what they are being taught to believe. So for six years I was thinking about it, whether I'm willing to be a soldier or not. And still I thought that if, if I will not get drafted, I will be some sort of a parasite or a traitor to society, because this is what we are trying to believe. So I was already an activist of sorts, I was already supporting, for, that, for example, the nuclear whistleblower, Mordechai Banun, which is already quite a radical statement, and still, even though all of this, I did get drafted. Because the social pressure is very strong. <laughs> then two months into the army, I didn't even have a chance to do anything. Thank God. Uh, two months into the army, I realized that I'm no longer a soldier. What I realized is that this whole notion of being a parasite or a traitor doesn't have any meaning anymore. Um, and I realized that my only obligation is to something that is universal, to humanity. I have no obligation to a state, let alone a criminal state like Israel. Um, so from that moment on, when I realized that I'm no longer a soldier, and my only obligation is to people rather than states, then the rest was very easy. Then obviously I joined the Palestinian Court of Struggle, and uh, whenever I went, the first time I went to speak abroad, it was very clear, it was, it's really a no-brainer that when I speak, when I, whatever I do inside is to oppose the crime, sometimes in a very symbolic way, but it's very important, sometimes symbolism is important. We do, we're not many people, but we do some actions to show that we stand up for people's rights and also to tell the world about what is happening is also very important. But whenever I speak abroad, it is not so much about struggling against the oppression, but actually motivating people to take action, to stand up for the oppressed. At the very least, you can be neutral. At the very least, the government of this country or any other government, if they claim to be neutral, that is fine. I, I would prefer that they stand by the oppressed. But at the very least, they should not be complicit in crime. That goes both for the governments and for the people of these governments. So, it's very clear, the situation is very clear, as I said. The question is, what do we do that is most effective? So inside, we oppose. We obviously do not serve in the army, which is a terror organization by any definition. Uh, we oppose alongside our Palestinian friends, who are oppressed and are struggling for their, for their basic rights, and simply for standing up for their rights, they are being oppressed even more. You know that according to military law in Israel, anyone, any Palestinian standing with a megaphone calling for a demonstration can be arrested for incitement. In these military tribunals, you have 99.7% conviction rate. This is how they get all their prisoners who are now on hunger strike. And it's amazing that they managed to lead this struggle from within the Israeli prisons. And they are the ones who are being looked after, not the government officials. So we do not serve in the army, we stand alongside the oppressed, and 
also call on you to do the same, to stand up with the oppressed, against the oppressor, and at the very least, not take part in crime. And it is proving to be quite successful, so we will carry on with that. Uh, I would like to ask uh, one more question. Is there like a, a really inspiring activity that you have seen or taken part in Palestine? Or is there any inspiring activity that you have seen when you travel around the world and give your uh, talks? So maybe it's two questions. An inspiring activity within Palestine and internationally. There was some action uh, that I was also involved in, which was what was, what was called Welcome to Palestine. After the flotilla, after the uh, boats that came to break the siege, the illegal criminal siege of Gaza, uh, which was a very good action, but also very costly, there was another <coughs> attempt to break more like the mental siege, uh, which is basically that internationals, international people, uh, bought plane tickets for a certain date, and they said we were coming to visit Palestine via Tel Aviv. Actually, it's only Tel Aviv. That's wrong. It is in Lille, at the defense Lille, uh, and they came via Israel to visit the West Bank, specifically to visit Bethlehem, simply for stating that they are coming to visit Palestine, rather than doing what is expected of them, which is to visit Palestine, but to say something else, to play the game and say, we are here as tourists and so on, we're here to, to see the sites, also Bethlehem, but also Tel Aviv and so on. No, they said very clearly, they, they took a stand and they said, we are coming to visit Palestine. And they had their visas and they had everything that they needed, their passport did not expire, and still, it was just crazy to see what was happening in Israel. There was sheer hysteria in Israel. Um, the airport transformed into this military facility, which in any way it is one of the most secure places, but they, it was transformed into uh, one of, like, clear military facility. Many airlines already blocked people in Europe and forbidden them for getting bored in their planes. And those who managed to make their way were arrested the moment they landed. Also, those few activists that wanted to come and welcome them, just go with welcome signs, welcome to Palestine. The second time we did it, so uh, we didn't come with welcome signs, we just came with drawings, picture children's drawings, kindergarten children who drew all sorts of nice pictures of Palestine, and we just stood there with drawings all of these people got arrested simply for doing that. So, so there was sheer hysteria, and that is actually amazing, that simply for standing up for something so simple, this is the reaction that it raises in Israel. I myself went to do an interview at the airport during the second Welcome to Palestine. It was a scheduled interview, a live interview at the airport. I never had a chance because uh, even though the TV crew was waiting for me and so on, uh, right after they finished interviewing the Minister of Interior and Minister of Defense of the Interior, Security, whatever, Internal Security, Minister of Internal Security, um, he just finished interviewing, and then came the police and the undercover police and all these. They told the TV crew to turn off their lights and their cameras. They happily did so. They came to arrest me like they arrested all the other uh, activists. Uh, and this went unreported, obviously, in the media. Including the competing TV channel, which was filming the whole incident. And, get, and asking me questions while I was being arrested. It never arrived at Israeli media. Because the media is absolutely complicit in this. There is there is some censorship in Israel, but mostly it's not about censorship but it's about self-censorship. So Israeli media will simply not report these things or will avoid reporting it as much as they can. Happily, they can no longer avoid reporting about BDS activity. It has become a real issue, a real hot potato. And uh, now they are reporting it, they don't like it, but they talk about it all the time. And that is, again, a very good sign.
with it. And I might mention that some of the activities we made with the mirrors, which was really inspiring to take a thousand young Palestinians to the, to the border and just let them have mirrors. But the Israelis would not let them have the mirror because everyone had a big mirror because I had, I had four, four, four big mirrors. Three of the people who carried the four the, the mirrors were shot in their legs and their and their like when back of their bodies, so they had to stay in hospitals or in their home for two months or three months. Anyway, one of the things that we are doing is, as we said, is highlighting the fa highlighting the human rights violations against the against um, Israeli human rights violations against the Palestinians. And one of the main aspects in our work in in, in Gaza. As we have other countries in the West Bank, but as we said, like we do almost the same that that anybody is doing in the West Bank, which is popular resistance against Israeli occupation. We in Gaza, we do also the same, but we don't have a checkpoint, so we go to something called buffer zone. So um, the most challenging things was for us is to start going to the 300 mile, 300 meters. That was very challenging, you know. So. And to just ex like accept that there is, we hope that we can inspire people outside to challenge because everything we do is about challenging. So when we did that, we did twice two things that I will tell you about. One is planting an 150 olive tree. To plant 150 olive tree, which will summarize the Israeli-Palestinian, like what so-called conflicts and what I call the Israeli, the Palestinian struggle against the Israeli occupation. So planting, go, coming to the 300 meters, that is a big challenge for the Palestinians. And for us to just take this, this challenge and, and like just also the Palestinian to come with us and get some international to come with us, that was a huge challenge. And also the bigger challenge when it comes, like when, when you see all this reports saying that saying in all the news that is, um, Palestinians are planting olive tree. In the meantime. Uh, Israelis are planting uh, pollet uh, inside the legs and the, the bodies of these Palestinians, you know, as they are doing in the West Bank and they are doing everywhere. So, these but these activities that we are we are we doing, you know, it's as as uh, and it's very symbolic, but it's very very effective. This is this is part like as he said, welcome in Palestine in 2010, far away from the Intifada Youth Coalition. We made something called Gaza Freedom March. There was 1,500 like activists. They came to Egypt and they want to come to Gaza, and they nobody could manage to come to Gaza. They keep protesting. They keep protesting. Nobody could come to Gaza at that, that time. Then they just allowed 50 people from 1,500 people to come to Gaza. The idea, as much as very small, you know, but it can get a huge, a huge effect. Like two, three people, as they said, like. Why Ronnie is very important in the Israeli and the Israeli scenes, you know, and his group because in the end there are, there are Israelis that are saying free Palestine. They are saying that there is there, there this, this this Israel is not Israel. It's 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 occupied territories, you know. This this Ministry of Security or whatever it's an, a Ministry of Occupation, you know, and that's what continues, you know, and that's what has to continue. And what we want. As I, without mentioning how inspired and how gassy route we are, is how we can inspire part of you to do the same things. Like how you can do inspired, inspiring activities here. You know how you can do BDS movement through your universities here. How you can buy a Hahaba and, and Soda Stream, and how you can do more activities. What can like what can inspire inspire you to to improve the the the, the concept of solidarity. You know, inside check with the Palestinian cause and with justice and with human rights in the Palestine, in the Israeli occupation in the Palestinian territory. I think you have actually stolen my last question. I might, I'm but just... I think I will ask anyway. And I wanted to ask, how do you see the struggle against the occupation connected to other struggles around the whole world, and how can they inspire, support, and influence each other? Maybe what do you say to people who ask, we have our own issues, why should we care about Palestine? I'll say just a short thing. Again, the BDS campaign is a Palestinian-led campaign, but it's a global campaign. And it's amazing how many people are taking part everywhere around the world. 
<coughs> there is, for example, what we call Israeli Apartheid Week, uh, which is a one week of events in universities. It started in Toronto almost 10 years ago. Nowadays, it is taking place once a year, a whole week of events in more than 200 campuses worldwide. This is really encouraging, and you have different student organizations, different groups <coughs> doing this activity, and we all work together. It's a very decentralized campaign, but with a lot of connections, and we're building connections all the time. So when people think that BDS is about no, 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 that we are against everything, actually it's the opposite. We're very much in favor, in favor of freedom, in favor of equality, in favor, in favor of justice, and we prove it by how we collaborate with each other all the time. Anyone who accepts these basic rights of Palestinians, also of Israelis, but they are not the ones whose rights are being tampered or hurt at the moment. Um, if you accept these basic rights, then there's more than room to cooperate, and this is what we do, and it's uh, really great. No, it's... Uh, I, uh, as as everybody saying, you know, like it's not like Ron said and I said the same. It's not complicated at all. There is people under occupation, and a lot of countries was under occupation. And when someone is under occupation, or with someone, when someone, with someone occupy your home, you will ask for your neighbors to come and help you, right? This is how it works. So we ask for your help. We ask for your 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 energy. We ask for where are you? What are you working? And what? How how you can how can you through your work your friend educate as much people as you can about the issues? How how yourself can be part of the BDS movements? And how you can be part of a Paris student university? How you can be be part of organizing an event, a conference, a, a seminar? How you can just like it's you don't have to be you don't have to be part of the known places. You just have to tell people that there is a there is a place where people are living under blockade. They are under occupation six years, and it's easy, not that complicated as you see it in the news, that they just call for human rights. And, and it's their human rights, like with uh, settlements, oh yeah, the EU is, is condemning settlements, and they are saying there have to be no settlements. Uh, international court is saying they have to destroy the wall, you know, and they have to be no wall. Everybody, on all these people that you saw in my presentation, that said they're saying they have to beat the blockade, it's eight years ago, you know. And this is easy, you know. What we have to do is just we have to call for justice and human rights. How is it, how easy is that? And inside us, we have to empower the 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 will. You know, it's not about we think of fertility. It's about will. You know, I, if you have the will to do for something, you will do it. So inspire yourself from inside. Get the will and do something. And you have a lots of a group. You have ISM here. You have your university. Some of you work in some organizations. And we don't tell you what to do in, in your country. I think you know what to do more in my, our countries. As much as we give you tactic, as much you might give us more tactic than we know that we can give you. Thanks a lot. Okay, then I think it's time for you to ask questions. If there are some, but I'm sure there, there, there are. <laughs> You can come here and use the microphone, maybe, the one, which is, or maybe that I can, I can just speak loud. Uh, I'm just interested because a couple of years ago, I was listening to the BBC program Outlook, and there was one thing that they pointed out, that uh, actually Jews and Arabs come from the same Semitic route. And they pointed out one thing that, and it was obvious, they arranged a sort of a bridge, like an online bridge, uh, between, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly if it was Gazans or if it was West Bank uh, students, and the students in Israel. And uh, the students could hear each other for the first time, and they were really surprised uh, what they got, actually the information from the other side because they were completely washed out, or brainwashed, if I, if I can use that. They didn't know anything, like the proper information uh, about the other side, and of course, they acted according to what they were taught all the time, as you said, and I'm just interested, you know, when 
can it happen like for you that you start to think in a different way? Like uh, if you don't get the proper information, how can you do it on bo both sides to get the proper information? Like not only that in Gaza that Israelis or Jews are only bad, and in Israel that Gazans and Palestinians are only bad. So what would happen? And it's probably naive. And I mean, how would the scenario would look like if I mean all the blockade would be say like deleted and and it would, I mean, is there any even will or imagination that you could start living like brothers as it was, uh, you know, at the very start? You know, it's uh, not like inspiring us to, you know, to say something against Jews or to say something against Palestinians because I've seen a couple of movies, I mean, on this issue, like that they were about Palestinians, but they were funded by Israelis and those uh, those um, you know directors were Israelis, like the. Say the bubble, the movie, one of them, or if I speak about Black Widow, <laughs> Black Widow or Omar, so it's always like an Israeli issue. I mean, the Palestinian issue, but these Israelis are funding it, and and it's not only like black and white. And I would like to know if you can give more information on that. Okay. So I'd like to speak a little about normalization, but before that. Yes, uh, the problem was never about uh, Arabs and Jews living together. It's not. A, uh, there's no uh, a problem with uh, you know the, the the clash of civilizations or religions. It's nothing like that. Actually, Jews fled from Spain and other places in Europe too. Uh, Arab countries, Muslim countries, and they had quite a good life there until Zionism. Also in Palestine, there was real coexistence at the time between Arabs and Jews and Christians and so on. Now, and the problem started with Zionism, it's very clear. Uh, secondly, according to you said that they come from the same roots, Arabs and Jews, or uh, Palestinians and, uh, let's say, Palestinian Arabs and Palestinian Jews. Uh, and it's true, according to DNA research, there are, they do come from the same DNA family. So Palestinians living in Palestine and Jews living in Palestine at the time come from the same roots, but Jews living in Palestine and those who came from Europe are from totally different DNA groups. And this actually also goes well with the more than theory, because there is some proof for that, that actually some Palestinians at least have also Jewish roots. And then we have converted with time. Even Ben Gurion, the, the arch criminal and first prime minister of Israel, uh, he acknowledged uh, uh, that the Palestinians actually had Jewish roots. Some of them I don't know, but uh, this is not the issue. I mean, this is just as a as a nice anecdote. Um, now about all sorts of collaborations and uh, in sometimes what is regarded as dialogue acts of dialogue. So I think that people have to talk, it's very important. Dialogue is very important. However, dialogue is also being used in order to divert the attention many times. So sometimes they bring uh, all sorts of groups of uh, Israelis and Palestinians to, to work together, to, to talk about the issue, to learn about each other. Many times youth groups meet up um, in different places. They discuss the situation, sometimes they even cry, they become friends, then they have to say goodbye at the end, and the Israelis go to serve in the army, and the Palestinians go to be Palestinians. So, so the question is, what kind of an effect does this really have? I mean, is this really, does it really change the situation? From the personal level, from the, the, the human interaction level, it's important. But what we're doing here is not just a human interaction type of thing. Like I said, the situation is Gaza, there is a humanitarian crisis, but it's a politically motivated crisis. And I can say a lot about that type of motivation, that type of sick thinking, type of thinking. But what we're doing here is struggling to change the situation. So in order to change the situation, uh, we do not agree uh, with such attempts that try to no normalize the abnormal. It is not a conflict among equals. You have a clear case of oppressor and oppressed. 
victimizer and victimized, apartheid people and those who are living subjugated under apartheid. And we have to acknowledge that. So in order for an act between Israelis and Palestinians not to be regarded as an act of normalization, there needs to be one thing, the understanding of the rights of the oppressed, acknowledging that the oppressed have rights, so standing by the oppressed, and secondly, refusing to normalize the abnormal, refusing to legitimate, to legitimize the illegitimate, at least symbolically, at least by saying that we do not agree to accept the legitimacy of the current situation, period. We do at least a very minimal effort to change the situation. It doesn't mean that we have to, to be freedom fighters. We can still go and have homes together or falafel together, but we have to acknowledge these with the rights of the oppressed and at least be willing to change the situation and not accept the situation as is. So in that with that type of thinking, some of these collaborations between Israelis and Palestinians are very much about normalization, and we are against that. Not because on the human level that is necessarily a problem, but because on the political level that sends a very problematic message. If you do take a political stand, if you do take the side of the oppressed, you do, you do not agree to normalize the situation, then you do whatever you want, it doesn't matter. <coughs> Are there any other questions? Oh, I have one question. Uh, uh, just, I mean, a lot of people will think of Palestine and Israel, or Palestine or Palestine and Israel, just people. It's Palestine and Israelis, it's just about how oh, we eat hummus together, we fell out together, we solve the conflict. Khalas. It's in the equation, end and that's it. And we have to come back to this, it's not about that at all, and it's not about hugging each other and seeing some photos and some programs saying, oh, we're hugging each other, really fine, smiling, kissing, whatever. When it's not about that a Palestinian fall in love with an Israeli girl and Israelis fall in love with a Palestinian girl. This is not the story that it showed show here, you know. It's, that's why it's all about, it's all about just this. How much we can do, I might give you two, step, two things. One is like, yeah, it's, media is very important. We are willing a lot and we're hoping that more independent media will go up. So it can at least let Czech people know. And that is how even Israelis and Palestinians can know about each other. One of myself, my dream, I wish I could do like a Hebrew, a Hebrew Arab like agency that which can have Palestinian and Israelis who know the truth, like Ronnie Maris says, like who know the truth and they both can write from different parts about the activities, the grassroots activities and all these things. Second is about normalization and what, what we have, what, what the BDS is doing. I tell you something, and during the 66 years of work, you know, we, we found, we tried a lot, like with Oslo when it comes, we tried lots of Israelis was coming to Palestine. Even during the, during the like let's say the first intifada, there were some Israelis was coming and staying in some Palestinian home in Gaza, and they were dancing with them and, and some of the, like some of the parties, you know. And also lots of Palestinians were also working inside Israel or in the West Bank, you know. And they know some Israelis. And now, with all that, it's like we have connection. It's not about being in context. And it's about pressure, you know. Uh, the pressures which uh, the, the EU and your countries did not manage to do and the, the US power which putting pressures to hold Israel all the time and handling up the veto in front of any things that Israel, that, that when any, anybody, any, any court, any United Nations will try to put pressure on Israel, this is, then, then, then things will be fine, will, will not be good because Israel is not having any implementations of any international law which have been done. They said destroy the world, they did not, they said settlements, human rights violations, stopped like over and over the, the borders, they did not do anything. All this human rights organization, which international human rights organization, human rights, UN, said nothing, doesn't work. So we needed another strategy. Another strategy is to make the constructive dialogue. And when you talk to someone, yeah, and, and how, and there is two constructive dialogue. The constructive, if you try to talk with someone and he doesn't, didn't, 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 didn't do anything, what you will do, you might start looking at him and be silent, right? So the constructive dialogue right now is just to look at him and be silent. You know, just like far away, I don't want to talk to you because you're not implementing these aspects, you know? So when they implement it, when they, when they, when they end the incubation, when they stop their human rights violations, when, then there will be, for sure, Yanni, when, they, when we have a state, like, like now it's like the two even the two-state solution is not a concept, Yanni. Two-state solution itself, it's not working. Because there is more than a half a million settlers inside, inside the settlement. And if anybody will study that, 
the settlements, you know, and the, the wall and what happened to the two state solution, it's almost destroyed. Even if they want to rebuild it again, or one state or whatever, you know, people is our people. They will always come together. Thanks a lot. I'd just like to clarify something that uh, I said sort of by passing. Um, there are those who speak the language of peace and human rights in order to carry on perpetuating Israeli crimes. We call them liberal Zionists. There is no, or sometimes they call Israeli left, there is no left in Israel, never was. There is no peace camp, never was. There is a handful of dissidents, that's it. Those who speak the language of peace in Israel, usually those who promote the so-called uh, two-state solution, <coughs> they speak the language of peace in order to protect their privileges, in order to perpetuate the situation. So, those people are also very much engaged in all these types of dialogues, the dialogues that I'm not in favor of, because they are not politically motivated, they are not about taking the side of the oppressed, they are just about creating this facade, this image of negotiation and dialogue and whatever, and as if, you know, if each side will just make a few concessions, then we'll arrive at peace, right, the solution. Actually, it's not like that. It's like that. There's one side that has to make concessions. It's not about making concessions. It's just living up to its obligations. And that's what needs to happen. At the moment, as long as Israel is a criminal state, what needs to happen is not coexistence, and it cannot, we cannot have coexistence when the basis is that of apartheid. What needs to happen at the moment is co-resistance, resisting together the oppressed and the oppressor, resisting together in order to end the crimes. Once we end the crime, then we have a long way to work, to do, in order to actually build something together, which is based on equality, respect of the minorities, multiculturalism, and so on. Then we will have a basis for coexistence. Until then, what we need is co-resistance. But it's possible? Co-resistance co is very much possible, that's what we do. Personally, we coexist. Exactly, but not Obviously, we coexist. We can't coexist. In, in your land, yeah. Coexistence existed before Zionism, and it will also exist after Zionism. Now we are here to end Zionist crimes. Yeah, I, I just kind of add also one thing. Add the new story. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's as he said about the, the Jewish, there is a group called, it's the smallest group in a Jew, that I've seen in Jew called the Samarists. You know, the Samarists are in, in Jersey and in another place, in Nabis. And they tell now, we try a lot of time to tell them, you guys have to come and take the Israeli nationality. They don't want to take it because they are Palestinians. Some of the Samaris, when one of the Samaris are in jail, is in jail right now. He's a Jew, he's a, he's a, a Samari Jew Palestinian. He's in jail because of what? Because he fights occupation. You know, and because he's part of the BFMD movement, which is a left group inside Palestine, and he fought against the occupation. So it's that is how how we we, we normally coexist together, you know, it's the Nakura Karta inside the US. They don't believe at all, even if it's a religious aspect, they don't believe at all. And lots of, lots of Israelis are now going outside of, they're going outside of Israel to Berlin. Look at, in Berlin, I think there is 30,000 Israelis. Yeah, it's like all of them, they're leaving Israel. There is a lot of immigration back to Israel. You know, lots of Israelis are trying now to take, the young Israelis trying to take another nationality because they don't want to live in, like under the oppressions. I have a lots of friends who they said to me, I was living, imagine, I was, it was, uh, I was in the beach when they were bombing Gaza. You know, I, I just could not imagine that there was bombing 30 minutes away from me, and I'm sitting in the beach having fun, you know? And they just could not accept it, so they went out to other countries. And even him, he just took his nationality soon, the Slovakian one, so he can escape. So, <laughs> not, not to escape, but to do, <laughs> to do, to do work outside. outside. To do work yes, outside, yes. yeah. That's right. Other questions? Can you maybe come here or speak loud? Maybe out of discussion, but I came late. But I would be interested. I heard a lot of information from Israelis, or I read some articles that you could put in perspective that there are some big big divisions in Israeli nation within different groups. And also your, your Palestinian friends could, could uh, inform us if there are any Palestinian divisions like below Fatah and uh, and his part, no, his part. Hamas. 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 So and then the, 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 there is a uh, rising tensions in Israel among Israelis. 
So the question was about division in, in uh, divisions inside Israeli society and also among Palestinian society. <coughs> yeah, so there is this uh, concept of left and right in Israel, or as I would put it, the explicit fascists and the implicit fascists. As I mentioned, there is no left in Israel. There are those who say explicitly they're racist and they're proud of it, and they say, this land is all ours, we have the rights, the others don't, let them go to another country and so on, or just don't care about it. At least they're honest about it. We have a lot to argue about moral issues, but we don't argue about the facts, because they, being racist, they are still much more aware of the facts, and they are aware that Israel was founded on the basis of ethnic cleansing, on the basis of kicking out the native indigenous people of the land. They are just they just think that this is a good thing to happen. So these are the explicit fascists or racists. Many of them are now in government. You have the implicit ones, which speak the language of peace and human rights, uh, and they are what is regarded as Israeli left. <coughs> and they say, we don't want this whole land that will be free of Arabs. We don't want to, to kick out everyone. We only want a small Israel that will be free of Arabs. We only want our privileges in a small land. We are modest. We don't want the whole of historic Palestine. That's the two-state solution, basically. This, according to the Zionists. <coughs> and um, this is just as illegitimate. So their argument uh, is about yes or no to a Palestinian state, None of them really wants a Palestinian state. They come up with all kinds of um, inventions about what a Palestinian state would look like, taking away everything that could resemble a state. And they also claim to have rights about doing that, that they can, cannot come up with demands about it, even though they have no rights about this issue. But uh, none of them acknowledge the rights of the Palestinians. You have many so-called left-wing uh, people in Israel who even support the boycott of settlement products, for example. And nowadays, when BDS is becoming more and more mainstream, they start speaking about saving Israel from itself before it reaches the apartheid cliff. First of all, it has reached it when it began in 1948. Secondly, even according to them, they can no longer claim that they are not an apartheid state because, according to official Israeli figures, there is no longer a majority of Jews between the river and the sea in historic Palestine. There's roughly half-half, not even counting the refugees which are outside in the diaspora, the Palestinian refugees. So now, when before, when the majority controlled the minority, they were happy about it. They, were, they didn't like it, but okay. But they could still claim that they are a democracy. That's the whole idea of Israeli democracy. If you're the majority, you can do whatever you want. But now that they are no longer officially a majority, now that they are a minority, they're really scared about what the world will think. These are the so-called leftists. They do care about what the world thinks. They care about what you think. And now they're trying to come up with all kinds of solutions in order to, to not be perceived in the world as what they are, which is a criminal apartheid state, which is a pariah state, which is a state that was founded on ethnic supremacy, which is a state that is illegitimate to the core. They can choose to become legitimate, they can choose to respect the rights of all, at the moment they are not. So there is no left. These are the distinctions. Also, there's other distinctions between Ashkenazi and Mizrahi. There's inherent discrimination and racism also among Jews, also against the ultra-Orthodox that Majid mentioned. There's all sorts of internal things happening. But, um, but the main thing is, is what I just described. And in that sense, there is no real difference. It seems as if there is some sort of a debate in Israel, but the whole debate is an internal thing. It doesn't affect Palestinians one bit. You finished with the Israelis. I started with Palestinians. And Palestinians are also having a couple of aspects. One of, one of it is two-state solution. One is, <coughs> one is calling for one-state solution. There is a conference. Rani was in the one-state solution conference. Which I could not attend. But anyway, and there is, uh, people are calling for a confederation of 
Palestine, Israel, and Jerusalem as a place for two governments. This is a new one which some of the leftists, as he said, like they're trying to create a new solution to the people. So one of the new solutions they created is the Israeli Palestinian Confederation. Anyway, uh, as we as everybody knows, we have Fatah, Hamas, we have Islamic Jihad, we have lots of the FLP and other parties, the left parties. Uh, what we what the, the PLO, which the Palestinian representative agreed on, is the two-state solution. You know, the two-state solution that that Hamas, Fatah, and Islamic Jihad not as time as you had, just Hamas, Fatih, and the FLD and other small groups of uh, left agree <coughs> about this two-state solution. But this two-state solution, as I mentioned before, it's not working at all. You know, with the uh, more than half a million settlers and our inside the green lines in the 67, so it doesn't work, you know, and also there is a lot of other districts. But anyway, there's other people because of this two-state solution it's not working on, so they're calling for one state use and even from the Palestinian. Let's go, we finished with the BLO, we have the divisions between, with, uh, with the Islamic Jihad and another, another, also some part of Hamas, who are calling that, hey, this is Palestine, it was always Palestine, the age of Israel is 66 years, so before the 66 years, it was, it was Palestine, I know, we all are refugees, we have 70% of Palestinian outside and inside are refugees, you know, so we have to come back to our villages. We own villages there. I'm always settled as a, fa a family in the Gaza Strip. Everyone, every cousins of mine, he have in his email. I just did it before I came to Europe. Everyone, I scanned all the my, of my grandfather and my grandmother papers, the land papers from the Ottoman Empire and from the British Empire, and I send it to all the emails of my of my families. You know, like my cousins, just to keep it because this is what we have. This is our land. This is our right. And we have to come back to this land. How it will work, how they will find a solution, this is something else. You know, it's me and Ronnie, before you come here, we find, like, we try to say, like, okay, like, guys, what we solution we have? I myself, let's say, as a Palestinian living in, uh, in Gaza, my activities, I'm, I'm into anything that can bring the Palestinian the right. They can have the right to return, and they can have the self-determination right, and they can have the 66 years of suffering, and they can have all the rights. Then there is there will be a solution. So if it will be one solution or two solutions. We can at least live together. We should do something. But I myself, I don't want more states. I really, I don't want more borders, and I don't want more checkpoints. It's like it's enough. You know, we divided the Czechoslovakia. It was chicken Slovakia. You know, like. Then they will divide it again, you know, and like all these countries, enough with borders, checkpoints. I myself call for one, for one world solution, you know. So I for sure would call for one state solution because, and with the solutions of everybody, you know. So this is the divisions among Palestinians, and and rights, and and how how old is a country, and how how our rights have to be, and how what what also that United Nations give us right. Thanks. Anybody else? We still have some time, 10 about, or 15 minutes, so... Can I ask Ronnie? Majid mentioned that he has a background, strong background, from family, like activist. How is your situation? Do you have support from your family? So the question was, if I have a background, Majid has a strong activist background. What about my background? I have a strong apolitical background. <laughs> I grew up in a totally apolitical family, also not very Zionist, but very mainstream. My parents care about me, they don't care about politics. Uh, also, when I tried to get out of the army, when I was a refuser or an objector, um, eventually they, they helped me, not because... Initially, when I said I'm not going to serve in the army, my dad said, so find another place to live in. That's kind of type of thinking. Then afterwards, uh, when they saw that I'm not... There's no chance that I'm going to stay there, and it was hell for me, a mental, like a mental occupation, not like a situation in Gaza, but, but still I was in a situation where I really didn't want to be in it. Mentally it was very difficult, and they were worried about me, and eventually they helped me to get out of the army. So, so because they cared about me as parents, not because they support my politics. Uh, also now, I mean, uh, and, and most Israelis, even though I said that it is a fascist society, and if I didn't, I would say no, um, most Israelis are not uh, 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 crazy racists, 
Um, they are just apathetic. They don't know and they don't want to know. And they make a lot of effort into not knowing. So also, when I speak to my family about things that happen, even very drastic things that I witness, they all the time try to divert the attention, unknowingly, unconsciously. And this is the way that... You have the same barrett. <laughs> and this is the way uh, this is the way that most I think Israelis work and I suppose that it happens the same in other societies uh, because the thing is that what I'm trying to say is that everything that Israel society is based on is lies they believe in Jewish and democratic being Zionist and moral you cannot be Zionist and moral it doesn't work together and shooting and crying all of these inventions. Uh, Zionism, uh, it claims to be it's a secular movement, but it claims that God promised them the land. It's, it's, a, it's all like, um, it's all a contradiction in terms. They say that this is their land because of 2,000 years ago, but they forget about what happened, whose land it was 70 years ago. It, does, it doesn't make sense. It's not a logical thing. So for them, in order to come out of it, it is really about questioning their own identity. And people don't want to be questioned about their own identity. It's too much for most people, so they find other ways to deal with it, or not deal with it. There was one question there. It's not a question, just I want to say some more. It's, uh, I call my respect to uh, you, for you, for everybody supporting Palestinians, because I think they did it because of the propaganda and what they had in them. So uh, my respect for you. Uh, so you know me because I think that you have a hard, you kind of have a tough time now. Uh, you lose many friends maybe because you are trying to say the truth to you because you are surviving really and you human conditions in, in, in Gaza or like in Palestine and for you and for ISN. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yes? I wanted to ask uh, Rami, uh, I suppose he lives in Israel, and I was wondering what is life like for him, like maybe a black sheep, are you safe, do they want to kill you? Or, so I was just wondering what's your life like in there, and I was wondering whether, um, don't the Israelis realize like the whole situation over there is like the most unique and maddest place in the world, um, they stand out in the world, so why do they do that? Are they humane? Are they human? I mean, the whole situation is just crazy. It's, I mean, the whole psychological, I mean, are they all crazy or half of them? How long can they go on uh, in, in like that? They're the most unique place in the world. Worse than any other. Okay, I'll start with the easy part, which is about myself. Crazy. Because, uh, yeah, the society is crazy, I think. <laughs> Uh, um, <clears throat> First of all, uh, the easy thing is to say that uh, I'm still the privileged, so uh, there is some sort of, uh, they are, the authorities are trying to give me trouble, not only to myself, other dissidents as well, but it is still quite limited. If I was a Palestinian, I would probably be in jail by now. Um, Having said that, there's also, uh, for example, Israel legislated an anti-BDS law in July 2011. <coughs> it hasn't been put to the test yet, because they're quite afraid about the consequences. But in July 2011, they legislated a law saying that anyone calling for boycott or endorsing boycott, participating in boycott of Israel, for political reasons, um, this is actually uh, illegal, and uh, they can be sued without even having to prove damages by those, can be sued by those who have been harmed by that boycott. So initially they wanted to have it more severe, it was supposed to be a criminal offense rather than a civilian offense, they wanted it to be retroactively, re retroactively put in place one year, which is crazy, eventually they, they put it aside, but anyway, so they softened the, the, the law, even still it is quite a silly law, that clearly shows that Israel doesn't care much about freedom of expression, political freedom of political organizing, and so on. So the first responses against the law actually came from the Israel lobby in the United States, 
because they understood how bad that makes Israel look. Uh, and it does. It, it exposes the true character of Israel. Now, that is a good sign. That law is a good sign because they're, they're really exposing themselves for what they are. Also, if they wish to, to sue me, let them. It'll be the best thing that will happen to the BDS campaign. It'll be in the mainstream media. Okay? So let them, because <coughs> the repression and the, um, also the repression of freedom of expression and so on, that's a common thing for Palestinians. That's not a big deal, even if they're Palestinian citizens of Israel. What is new about this law is that they are using the same means against the privileged. That's the only thing that's new about this law, but it's quite, quite a change. Um, but we have to put it in perspective. They do this all the time. They only now also implement it towards the dissidents, the Israeli dissidents. Um, the BDS campaign was under the supervision of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then they were doing all sorts of hasbara, all sorts of uh, propaganda activities around that, trying to convince the world that actually Israel is a wonderful democracy and so on, or trying to divert the attention towards other things like chocolate and uh, things like that, and Israeli wines. Uh, nowadays, it is under the, instead of being under the supervision of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it is now under the supervision of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. So now BDS has become a strategic threat, pretty much at the same level with Iran. I don't know which is more dangerous, the fourth largest nuclear superpower in the world, or the country that is maybe working on nuclear arms, but anyway, BDS is now uh, at the same level of uh, the Iranian threat, according to these right? Um, other than that, there's some harassment here and there, but uh, but it's still it's still workable. Yes, yes, yes. It is still workable. Yes, I am regarded as a traitor in Israel, probably, but um, that's the case of being a dissident. Anybody else would like to ask? The, the conclusion is that it's still a long way to, you know, for, as you say, that everybody's faces in, in Israel, and even those who try to say that they are actually willing on, you know, changing something. So it's still a long way that would be a new generation that would come with an idea really to actually destroy the border and start a completely new life. I mean, the life that uh, both nations can live together. I mean, it, because it sounds like that it's, it's, it's still like, even though we go from outside and we press, and but if there's no change in people's mind, I mean, inside is well. So I, 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 will, I will say quite the opposite. Okay, so Being an optimist, yeah? nothing has changed for the past 60 some years. Mm -hmm. Israel did whatever it does with full impunity. Finally, things are changing. I don't know how long it will take. In the struggle against South Africa and apartheid, it took about 30 years until the struggle became mainstream and eventually all countries of the world were boycotting uh, apartheid in South Africa, other than Israel and the US, who are very good friends with uh, South African apartheid. Acting President Shimon Peres tried to sell nuclear weapons to South Africa. They were arming South Africa to its teeth and so on. They, they were very good friends. One part I said was very good friends with the other. Um, but, but it took about 30 years and eventually it became mainstream. We're only 10 years since uh, the BDS campaign was launched and we have made quite a lot of progress. I haven't gone through all the different successes. Definitely it's not enough. We still have a way to go. But things are changing and that is very, very reassuring. Secondly, about Israeli society, there is this romantic notion that things have to change from within. I am absolutely not in agreement with that. It, doesn't, it absolutely doesn't matter what the apartheid people think about apartheid. In South Africa, you had only about 2% of white South, Africa, South Africans who, um, who, were, who said anything against apartheid at the time. It's not that they woke up all of a sudden one day and said, ah, you know, maybe 
maybe this is a bad idea, maybe we have to change it. They were forced into change. And the same will also happen in Israel. So it, I couldn't care less what the apartheid people think about apartheid. What I care about is how do we end it. After we end the crimes, then we actually have to live together. Anti-Zionists and Zionists and whoever, you know, all sorts of people have to live together with very different backgrounds and different beliefs. And that is going to be a challenge, but, um, but that's what we're working on. But that can only happen once we have this basis of equality and uh, rights of everyone, not only rights of the privileged. At the moment, we have to struggle against the crime. I, and I'm hopeful about it. I'm, I'm optimistic about it. Actually, there was one step, like Palestine was accepted by UNESCO, so, it's, so what do you think about <coughs> that? Was Palestine was accepted in the UN as the 194th state, observing state, rather than accepting UN Resolution 194, which is much more important, which is the right of the refugees. So um, rather than having uh, the 194th state, I would rather see the 194th resolution being implemented. And um, yeah, I can go into Palestinian politics. I will not say good things about uh, the acting politicians, but it doesn't matter because the, sole, the main responsibility is not with the Palestinians who are oppressed, but with the oppressors. I, I bought myself on the side of Ronnie. I'm one of the optimistic guys and I, I'm very optimistic and very hopeful every day. Like every like every day I'm traveling to another country and give talks in, in universities and see all these people who are sending emails that they woke up, you know, and they are inspired. And that's what even Mironi was talking about, like how what we want from each uh, workshop is two or three guys that are committed to work in the group that is organizing the place, you know. So what we want is is you guys, you know, that because you're part of how we ending all this and incubation. You are part of what we are calling for. And because as, 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 like he's talking from an Israeli side, as a Palestinian, like we are part of establishing as we can, uh, like building a community. You know, we try to, to have the BDS things, we try to, to, build, to build our, our, like our politics more. You know, but in the end, who have the power? Is Israel. Who are going to change? Is Israel. Who others have, have, have the powers? Is America and EU. Who is part of the EU? Is you. Who are part of the part of the U.S. The U.S. citizen, U.S. citizen started, and that was never happens. When he, when we said that there is 200 campuses in the world just having the apartheid week, it's not an easy, it's not an easy job. You know, it's it's a real. When he's when we say that there is lots of like hundreds of universities right now that are calling for that they 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 end they buy put universities in all Israel. It's not a job. It wasn't in another. In, it wasn't in Norway. And there is the National Museum in Norway, by put all ties with Israel. Trade union in Norway, by put all, like this is, even though it's the right wing government, you know, in Norway, but they still have the trade unions working like they, they buy put all Israel. And that was a surprise for me, because people, we people can change. We decide politics, we decide policies. We are the ones who are responsible of our politics, what we do in our place, our universities, our institute, how this could work. So part of the struggle on how we ended is you. You know, it's you and you struggle with us. As we said, as, as them, as Israel and, and as a paratai, just take someone who's under, it's like the white people, like as, like, like just South Africa, like as the white people did not feel anything, you know, and they will not feel, you know, because they don't want to, like as we said, they don't want to know, and they force themselves and make effort they don't know. So, and I, we, what we calling, what we, what the opposite that we call for, if they don't want to know, and they are making, because they are in and privileged, you know. So you are the ones who should walk them up, and you are the one who should walk your community, and you are the ones who should change things from the outside. So we, I myself believe that you guys can change things from outside. You guys can can do things from your countries, which much more effective. The BDS is from the outside, not from the inside. Even though we say we are symbolically making it from within. I tell you why. He's he's making bypass movement from Israel, but how many there are? It's just a couple of hundreds, a couple of thousands even, you know? I yeah, and I wish we wish even I have you know. But even in, in Gaza let's say and even the West Bank, you know, we we Palestinians we have even products made in Israel. It's not because we we want that, because Israel is forcing us to just send like take products which made in Israel. You know, as they force us to take their electricity and we pay taxes for it, 
and they force us to be, they force us to take the water and we pay taxes for it. They force us to take everything from them. We pay taxes for it. We pay taxes for our occupation to buy the weapons, you know, and test the test test the weapons on us, you know, and then sell it to Czech Republic. And they say to them, you guys, don't worry, our weapons is the best. We we already tested the phosphoric bombs on the Palestinian in Gaza, and it works very well, you know. Like they test like let's say there is um, like. Well, they test everything, like, I don't want to just do this in a couple of places, but they test everything from Palestine and they send it to the world. So what we have is something from outside that can come and can change the inside. Awareness from outside can, can come and can put pressures and make the U.S. power and the U.S. people come down, you know. And, like, we want millions of red, red cards, you know, stop with the yellow card. Yellow card is waiting and waiting and waiting. We need a red card. A red card can tell tell Israel, just go out, you know, like you just, if you don't want to implement human rights, but like human rights law, you should go out. If you don't want to, if you don't want to do anything, so you just, this is the red line. So we are the ones who have to carry the red cards for Israel and say to them, stop, that's enough. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question? Um, how does Palestine make money and what is the currency? Uh-huh, that is part of the accusation, <laughs> everything. I tell you, it's like, I think my clothes, no, I'm, that, this is, no, no, this is, I'm sure. I bought even, I was made in China, I had a coffee, uh, uh, which is, yeah. How are you buying clothes there, for example? Yeah, this is, this is uh, what I'm going to tell you. And I bought a coffee in, in Gaza, which is not made in Palestine. Finally, I found a coffee, which is made in Palestine, I bought it in Norway, in a shop, you know that. So, I could not find it in Gaza, because we don't have it in Gaza. We, we just brought it from, we bring it from China and they come through the Israeli side, we pay taxes to the Israeli side to bring it, to, to bring it through Gaza. So we, this is how we do it. So everything that is in Gaza, even our clothes, has come through the Israelis. How we, pay, how we work? It's, a, like, it's really a huge question because in the end, 80% of Palestinians who live in Gaza, for example, let's say about Gaza, they, are, they, didn't, like, they depend on aid. Aid coming from UNA, United Nations, and aid coming from aid, like aid organization. It's not because they want that, no. Just because uh, even United Nations, sorry, like even reducing all the aid that comes to the Palestinians, and there's 45,000 Palestinian now families who are used to get aid 60 years ago, till now they, did not, now they don't get aid. Why we are forced to do that? It's not because of anything it's that Israel. Now we're gonna build anything in Gaza. We don't have cement. Let's say, if we're gonna build, if we're gonna have anything that you need to just restart like our factories, it's always bombed. Our airport. I was telling Ronnie in the way. I wish I could travel from our airport, but it's just one wall, you know. And one of the most difficult questions that I would love to ask the Minister of Occupation in Israel, you know, and tell him like, why you just bomb uh, like? Gaza airport, like you bombed it first time, it ends, you know? And there is one wall. Anybody, I wish you all can come to Gaza, we'll go to Gaza airport, you know? It's just one wall, and it's empty area. Why you just bomb it every year about 20 times? 20 times, every time they want to test the bomb, they bomb the, the Gaza airport, you know? And nothing is there. But that so, is a different story. There is a story that there are attacks from Hamas, and Israel has to respond. Yeah, but there is, there is one, there, there is other things that, that is what that is thing, that this thing of the bomb. And now between 2000 and 2012, you know, there has there was being clashes with the Intifada, okay? And there is the Palestinians always have the right to defend themselves, you know, and they have the right to resist. That is depends on international law and depends on United Nations law, okay? Israel, like between 2000 and 2012, did not have anybody was killed through that. So that through, like they have about five, I think, five, five or six. No, 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 no. Five was killed between 2000 and because of the rockets. Because our rockets are homemade rockets. The point that they had about seven years ago, they have something called the Iron Dome. Okay, the Iron Dome it's a, it's a, a way, a military way, where any rockets can come out of Gaza. We are Palestinian against it, even because we are against all violence aspects. But in the end, you know, it's part of our resistance, and we are calling. That's why we, it's not called the non-violence. We don't call it non-violence. We call it popular resistance because we have to. We have to. Uh, Carry the right for us to defend ourselves. The same. If you have a thief coming to your home, you will not carry a knife. Will you tell him, you know, you will come? You will carry a knife to protect yourself because he might kill you, right? The same. We have the least things that we have, even though we know ourselves that the rockets that is sent to Israel, by the way, half of it it says fall in Palestinian homes, you know, in the border. So it doesn't work, you know. But Israel, when we send something, it's 
it come back from, as they say, a defense, def it's not defense, defense mechanism. It began to be like offense mechanism because you send one rocket, they send a hundred F-16 bomb back. So the hand, like, this is how, how it works. They send one, they send ten back. They send, so it is, yeah, it is, um, what we have is we have the right to, the right to resist, the right to self-defend ourselves. We as Palestinians, as, we, as I said, is um, against. Um, I, like we we try as much as we can to do uh, to do popular resistance. You know the way the way the way of nonviolence way. But Israel is just keeping all this occupation and till they arrive to our mentality. So you can get someone with can what can do. Um, it's getting quite late, so I think I will give space for the last question if there is one. The last one. <laughs> and if not, then I will. Once again, I saw a question, but uh, yesterday some people from this Google on Chomsky meeting, uh, and I think Chomsky said some one interesting thing which could be applied to the situation. That somebody at the end of the discussion asked him what we can do as an activist, as an activist for something to improve or something. And he said simply, okay, you should, you should make uh, power elite to change power elite. Yeah. So the way how to change the, the attitude of our state towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is to vote for people who are a little bit more unbiased than, for example, Mr. Zeman is as a president, yeah, who, who, who helps really pro-Israel uh, stance in, in this. This situation. Yeah. So, if somebody wants to be an activist, it doesn't mean that he has to organize something to do as a pro Palestinian action or so, but he can simply help himself when he is going to vote a new government or something or a new parliament and try to find it if such a politician can, can be more unbiased in, in this foreign uh, affairs. And he said one thing also, he ended up, he end up with having the will, not waiting for an opportunity. So if you have the will, you will do something, you know? And it's, I, I'm the one who asked the question, by the way, that's why I listened to it very well. Lots of people are very, this is very important issues. Like listen, lots of you are very afraid of being labeled, you know? Am I a journalist and an activist? Am I working in this or working this? Being, being afraid of being activist, being afraid of taking a challenge. What we did in Palestine, you know, like, and even away with Israel also, we just managed to have a challenge, you know, we challenge everything, we challenge the occupations, we challenge ourselves, we challenge our family, we challenge, I tell you, even though I'm Palestinian, my family is very scared that I'm already working, for, like, working in the buffer zone, working with fishermen, working, I have been threatened by Israel three times, you know, by the phone, by emails, by Twitter, by lots of places, you know, so it's like crazy how, how you just can, can handle all this, but I still I have a will. We're very optimistic for change, you know. We're very optimistic that this is, we're not very, we're not at all afraid of being labeled on, on anything. If you're an activist, if you're a journalist, if you are finance, if you are working in anything, in the end we all part of the circle of change. And we have to do something. So just have a will and then you'll change anything. Being part of anything can send you issue. So adding to that, uh, I agree that things happen, things have to change from the top. If the US stops supporting Israel, apartheid will end, occupation will end. If the EU stops supporting Israel, the same thing, it will not be able to carry on doing whatever it does without the support that it gets from the US, Canada, Australia, and every member state of the EU, including the Czech Republic. Um, but, with all my great respect to Professor Chomsky, uh, I think that he tends to, clo to gloss over the main point. And the main point is that Israel is a supremacist state. There is nothing legitimate about Zionism, not in the Zionist project as it was implemented in Palestine. Maybe something about the Zionist ideology a long time ago was something about it was legitimate, maybe. 
nothing was legitimate about the way it was implemented in Palestine. And um, so if we arrive at a political solution, the way that the politicians want to have it, we will not have the rights of the people. That is why it's very important for the people to stand up to the politicians. And I'm talking both about the Palestinian politicians and the Israeli politicians and the European ones. Okay? When the so-called Palestinian so-called authority says that uh, if Israel will um, um, offer them a nice deal, then they are willing to renounce the right of return, that is absolutely legitimate. Also, Mahmoud Abbas is, not, is in no position to renounce the right of return other than his own right to return to Safed. That is the only right that he can renounce. But this is a personal right and, and Palestinians have the right. Same goes for equality. I'm not willing to have half a quote or three quarters of equality. It's either equality or nothing. There's nothing in between. I'm not, it's, at the moment, you, you're either in favor of, of apartheid or against apartheid. There's nothing in between, I'm sorry. I wish there was. So, the politicians are trying to come up with all kinds of clever uh, ideas about how to have half apartheid, three quarters apartheid. I'm not willing to play this game. We're insisting on rights, on all three fundamental rights of Palestinians. How is it going to be implemented? I don't care. One state, two states, five states, zero states, it doesn't matter. It matters because it has, you know, it has different consequences, but, but this is negotiable. What is not negotiable are the rights. And uh, this is what we have to demand of the politicians, and also the Czech people have to demand of their politicians, at the very least, to be neutral. At the very least, not to support the criminals, as they do at the moment. Hopefully, they will also choose to stand by the oppressed, and that will make it easier on us. Thanks. Before Eva finishes, uh, I would like to thank everyone for coming here, and um, mainly Majed, Rani, and um, Eva for moderating it. Uh, this event was uh, organized by a small group of volunteers, and I would like to ask uh, any of you who would like to take an uh, active part in, um, in anyway, organizing events, uh, spreading out the information, being more active, uh, from time to time, come to a meeting, uh, spread the word, uh, brainstorm, have some ideas. Uh, you can uh, contact us uh, either by our website, ism-check.org, or you can write your email address, unless you have already written it down, so that you can contact us and we can meet and we can talk. Uh, second thing uh, is, um, um, if you have not uh, signed the presentation paper, just sign it with Ramana. And uh, one of the last things is that uh, Majet will be staying here till uh, Monday morning and uh, still we will have a chance to meet him again. It will not be obviously the same topic because Ronnie will be long gone to Brno and Salzburg and then back to Jaffa. But Majet will be uh, here on Sunday at uh, half past six um, on Sunday evening at Cross Club. He will show a part of a documentary that he was uh, uh, participating in. He made production of a National Geographic uh, documentary about Gaza and uh, the West Bank occupation. So we will show that film and then it will be open discussion. Majid will be able to touch uh, some other topics or in, in more detail. So you are welcome to come. We will put it on the website, but uh, for sure it's uh, happening Cross Club in Halashovitz, Sunday, uh, half past uh, half past six, and uh, I think that's all. Thank you again, and maybe Eva, if you want to conclude, I leave it to you. I am a bit tired. It's like they're welcome to come, but uh, I, they are, you are welcome to come, and because it's the first move to change, right? So the first move you have to do is to catch the hand of a friend of yours, or your father, or your mother, and bring her with you, because if we are now 60, next time should be 120. This is how the change could be. One time you convince one person, you know, and then you bring him with you. So we hope that you have the message right now. Don't tell me like you got, you got not enough time, you know, you have four days, you know. So bring as much people as we can, because, because our main mission, me and Ronnie, is awareness. And to tell, not to tell you what to do, but at least to inspire as much people of you as we can. 
because we want to come home and sleep in a good pillow and say oh, there is some people that can protect us when we come back home and fight again because we don't know if we will be good enough for the next year or the second year we'll be in jail or we'll be somewhere else we don't know but in the end at least what we will be happy whatever we will be that we will educate another one person so i wish that someone all every one of you would bring another person another friend with him from you thanks okay i think we all heard a lot of things we now have a lot of to think about i think you will i hope i hope you will walk away inspired not depressed like me yeah. and when you take a shower tomorrow think of measure <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a